After our ship has left Tarragona, our next voyage took us to the port of Kamsar in Guinea, West Africa, to load a cargo of bauxite. For this voyage, our cargo is a mineral ore called bauxite. Bauxite is a mineral which is the world's main source of aluminum. Although bauxite looks like an inert and harmless substance, it is potentially one of the most dangerous cargoes that ships can carry. When we hear dangerous cargo, most of us might immediately have images of explosive or highly toxic substances. But for dry cargoes such as bauxite, the real danger lies in its tendency towards liquefaction and dynamic separation. These two phenomena have caused bulk carrier ships to sink within minutes and in the past 10 years have claimed the lives of more than 100 seafarers. A few years ago, back in 2015, the Bahamas flagged vessel Bulk Jupiter, which at the time was loaded with about 46,000 tons of bauxite, sank off the coast of Vietnam, taking the lives of 18 crew members, leaving only one survivor to tell the tale. Although the accident could not officially be attributed to cargo liquefaction or dynamic separation, mainly because there's not enough actual physical evidence, it opened the discussions on the hazards associated with the carriage of bauxite. To provide more context, let me tell you the story of what happened to Bulk Jupiter. The details were gathered from the Marine Safety Investigation Report of the incident. On the 17th of December 2014, Bulk Jupiter commenced loading bauxite at Kuantan Port in Malaysia. Over the course of the next 13 days, loading operations occurred intermittently due to heavy and prolonged rainfall. The cargo declaration supplied by the shipper indicated 10% moisture content, but because of the heavy rains and the cargo being exposed to it, the ship's master had some concern over the actual moisture content, but he did not carry out any tests on board or ask for independent tests. On completion of the loading operations, the vessel sailed on the evening of the 30th of December headed for Hong Kong to load bunkers. While en route, the master received a weather forecast highlighting a tropical storm in the region and was provided with alternative waypoints in order to reduce exposure to gale force winds and waves. The next day, the vessel started rolling heavily as the weather started to deteriorate. On the morning of January 2nd, at around 0640 hours, the general alarm was sounded, followed by the master's announcement, directing all crew to proceed to the bridge. At this point, the ship started rolling heavier, leaning more to starboard. Based on the accounts of the sole survivor, who is the chief cook, while on his way to the bridge, he met fellow crew members who told him to proceed to the port side lifeboat. He went back to his cabin and, after getting his life jacket and immersion suit, he made his way to the lifeboat, but suddenly, a blackout occurred. Shortly after, the emergency lights came on and the vessel stopped rolling, but it adopted a 45-degree list to starboard. Now, due to the angle of list, the chief cook was unable to make his way to the port side access door, so he decided to use the internal staircase and went up to sea deck, where he met the captain. Together, they went outside via the starboard side access door. No other crew members were seen by the chief cook after this point. With the waves washing over them, both the captain and the chief cook jumped into the sea wearing their life jackets. They saw a life raft floating, but it was too far for them to reach. The two men stayed together while swimming away from the ship prior to its sinking. As they looked back, they saw the vessel had almost disappeared beneath the waves. 
it only took about 20 minutes from the time the general alarm was sounded for the ship to finally sink. At 1410 hours, the container ship Zim Asia reported sighting two persons and believed them both to be alive. The tugboat OLNG Mutra headed to assist and by 1556 hours, the two were recovered and brought on board. But unfortunately, the master was in very poor condition and despite the tug crew's best efforts to revive him, he did not survive. A total of nine ships and three aircraft assisted with the search and rescue operation, which continued for three more days. The chief officer was also recovered, but he was already deceased. Out of the 19 crew members, only the chief cook survived. The bodies of the master and the chief officer were recovered, while the 16 other crew members were never found. Again, as mentioned earlier, the loss of bulk Jupiter cannot be officially attributed to either cargo liquefaction or dynamic separation, as there was no physical evidence to support it because the ship was never recovered. But based on recorded reports and email exchanges between the ship and its managers, there is more than enough reason to suspect that it was one of the major factors, primarily because the bauxite's moisture content was way more than 10% which is what is allowed for it to be stowed safely on board. This was evidenced by the test results, which the exporter commissioned for their own purposes, which indicated that the moisture content was on average 21.3%. These results were delivered around two weeks after the incident, as it was never intended to inform the ship's master in the first place. So a lot of you might be wondering, how would something like cargo liquefaction or dynamic separation sink a huge ship within a span of 20 minutes? Liquefaction takes place when loosely packed waterlogged sediments lose their strength and turn into a fluid-like mass in response to strong vibrations or shaking. So in essence, it will behave like a liquid and will have the tendency to flow. For dynamic separation, I'll be using this clip which was produced by the Australian Maritime Safety Authority as a visual to explain how it works. During dynamic separation, the cargo compacts inside the holds, which then forces moisture upwards. This causes a slurry of water and fine particles to form on the surface of the cargo. This liquid, of course, will flow from one side to the other due to the ship's motion and will create an unstable, top-heavy situation as simulated by the ball bearings in this clip. Over time, the wave action of the slurry in each hold warps the ship's normal motion. Eventually, the movement of the slurry in each hold aligns, resulting in a buildup of cargo on one side of the ship and potentially a sudden shift of the compacted cargo beneath. In some cases, the sudden shift of cargo can cause the ship to list severely or even capsize. So in simple words, the dry cargo becomes partially liquid and starts flowing from one side to the other, thereby messing up the ship's stability. Now add in some heavy weather to that mix and the results will be catastrophic. So how could they have prevented this from happening? Based on the report, there was an email exchange between the ship's managers and the captain regarding the concern about the bauxite's moisture content. Apparently, the ship's manager suggested carrying out a CAN test in order to immediately determine if the cargo is in danger of liquefaction. Unfortunately, there was no more follow-up regarding any results of the CAN test or if it was even conducted. So, a lot of you might be asking, what the heck is a CAN test? Well, basically, you got a can, maybe a tin can or something similar, put some cargo sample in it, 
and then strike the can on a hard surface from a height of about 20 centimeters 25 times. If the sample remains dry on top, then it's all good. But if some water or a slurry forms on the surface, as shown in this clip, it means that the moisture content is above the specified limit and there is a danger of liquefaction. There are other cargos that are also susceptible to liquefaction such as nickel ore, iron ore, and some types of coal to name a few. So what if the cargo is verified to be susceptible to liquefaction? What can the captain do about it? When our ship was loading bauxite, I asked the captain the exact same question, and he actually had a lot of experience dealing with cargo disputes, including bauxite. He told me that there was this one time it had been raining heavily for a few days and the cargo was just piled up in the open and exposed to the rain. Naturally, if it's raining, cargo operations will be suspended, but when the rain stopped and the loading resumed, the bauxite was like mud. So he called the terminal representative to stop loading. The representative disagreed, but the captain insisted. So the terminal guy threatened to stop the loading indefinitely and send the ship back to the anchorage area. To which the captain said, go ahead and do what you must, but you're not loading that wet cargo onto my ship. At that point, the captain had already gathered photos of the wet cargo, the results of the can test, email exchanges between the ship managers, the charterers, and the ship owners, and then he lodged a note of protest indicating the reason why the loading operation needs to stop. Since he had enough documented evidence to support his protest, the ship owners backed him up completely. And although the ship was sent back to the anchorage area for a few days, the charterer could not impose penalties or claim off hire because it was a safety issue and the cargo was obviously off spec. The terminal threatening to delay the ship for days, that's a big issue. In these cases, it is very easy to fall victim to commercial pressure. I mean, sure, there will be times when it might be more beneficial to give in and arrive at a compromise, but never, ever in the expense of safety. Because if you do, you are definitely the one on the losing end of that deal. For our ship, we completed our loading operations and delivered our cargo of bauxite safely and without incident. Just another voyage concluded, another mission accomplished, another chapter in our life at sea.